Welcome to The Writing Life, the podcast for anyone who writes. I'm Steph McKenna. And I'm James Gill. From the National Centre for Writing here at Dragon Hall in Norwich, England. This month, the topic of discussion is the dreaded revision. To help us understand how, when and why we should revise, rewrite and redraft our work, I spoke to writer and NCW course tutor Lynn Bryan. We discussed the importance of revising one's work, how revision is different for different types of writer, when to do what kind of revision and the role of third-party feedback. Lynn received her MA in creative writing in 1985. Her first book, Envy at the Cheese Handout, which is an amazing title, was a collection of short stories back in 95. Two novels, Gorgeous and Like Rabbits, followed in 1999 and 2002. She's co-edited six anthologies of short prose. Her work has been broadcast on Radio 4 and her story, A Regular Thing, was made into an award-winning short film in Denmark. Needless to say, Lynn knows her onions, which is why she teaches our Writing Fiction Next Steps course. The September term also sees the introduction of three brand new online Next Steps courses for all those people who've taken our Start Writing courses, or for anyone who feels they're ready to take their writing to the next level. Next Steps courses run for 18 weeks online, and you can find out more about genres and modules on our website. And of course, we have our ever popular range of Start Writing courses for beginners, including fiction, crime, non-fiction, historical fiction, poetry and script writing. And you can head to our website to browse genres and find out more about those modules. Both Start Writing and Next Step courses are tutored and you'll receive one-to-one feedback from that tutor, people like the fantastic Lynn Bryan. I really love speaking with Lynn uh, in this conversation. A fantastic writer, wise tutor, and a lovely person. Unfortunately, there is some uh, noise that comes through from the room upstairs, such as the nature of this building. Um, but it only happens at two sort of uh, periods for a couple of minutes. So please bear with, persevere, um, and uh, and it'll sort itself out. Our chat is packed with useful insights on rewriting and redrafting, and I really hope you get as much from it as I did. And so, without further delay, we bring you Lynn Bryan. So Lynn, welcome. Thank you so much for coming in to talk to us today. I'm, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. And I know that we've we've had a bit of a chat on the phone to kind of talk about the kinds of things that we're, we're going to go through, uh, which is a how-to, rewriting, redrafting and editing. But before we sort of get into a few um, of, of the specifics, just give us a bit of a potted history. What's your kind of, uh, what's your kind of route? And also, what's your relationship with us here at the National Centre for Writing? Well, I started writing a long, long time ago. As a child, I found it a kind of place to escape to and absolutely necessary to me. I left home for college. I was the first person in my family to actually go to uh, to do a degree. Um, and there was an element in that degree of creative writing. And uh, I actually couldn't believe that it was a subject that you could uh, study. And it felt an enormous privilege and terribly exciting And I eventually ended up uh, studying on the MA in Creative Writing at the UEA a long, 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 long time ago. So there are only about seven students there on my course. There's, well, I don't know, there are about 60 now, I think, (laughs) in the various different components, not just in prose. But there was only the single kind of prose writing uh, post-grad course then. And my tutors were Malcolm Bradbury and Angela oh. Carter. And I liked the, the kind of sparring between those two. And Angela Carter was enormously supportive. I don't think I'd have got through that course without her because I felt kind of quite uh, not up to it, really. I met my partner Andrew on that course from a very similar background to me. He was the first one in his family to go to university. We kind of clung together and have clung together ever since. And we chivied each other along and helped each other with our work. We did other jobs, we had family, but we kept writing and writing and writing. I was accepted for publication before Andrew, and I was very chuffed with that. (laughs) But then he was accepted a little bit after me, and he won prizes, which I wasn't, you know, oh, well done, Andrew, but I was a bit kind of miffed. (laughs) And then we've carried on. Andrew is now, uh, well, I've taught at the UEA as well, so I've done full circle, and I've gone to the UEA to teach. Um, Andrew is a professor on that course. The Writer's Centre, I've kind of, because of bringing up 
our daughter, um, and particularly because she was ill for quite a long time. I've kind of done little bits of work here and there. And the Writer Centre very kindly have, you know, given me an opportunity to teach on the online courses. So I've done lots of different kind of teaching of writing over the years. Um, I've taught at the Arvon Foundation, I've taught at art schools, I've taught adults, I've taught children. Uh, I never taught online until I started teaching for the Writer Centre and actually I really enjoy it because it's, diff it's different to what I've done before. So I've written three books of fiction, two novels, one book of short stories. I've edited uh, six or more books of mixed prose and my most recent book is a memoir which is obviously non-fiction and that's about life with my dad who was disabled. Um, and so it was when we spoke on the phone we were saying that the issue is, and I realise I can sort of over technicalify things. Yes. You know, it's like I'm looking for these sort of these methodical building blocks of, well, yeah. if you do this and you do this and you put this here and do that, boom, you've got a best selling novel and it's going to be fantastic. Mm -hmm. And so it's while that there are, uh, there is technique, mm -hmm. but at the same time, there's the magic part, the bit that's hard to describe, the bit that where there are no rules. Yes. And so what we're, we're talking about, I think it seems a lot of what we're going to talk about today is where those two things meet. Yeah. You know, and so there's, we're sort of we're we're generalising these general guidelines about best practice, um, of which to which there are lots of caveats, and that's what I think is exciting. Is it's not it's it's strangely scientific, but but magical. It's alchemical. I think because I've been writing for a long time, and the creative writing courses were very fresh and new, totally new. There was only the UEA course, and then a course in Lancaster. There wasn't the pedagogy that there is now. Nowadays, there's been a total analysis of what writing is about. When we started writing, the magic was the, the bit that we concentrated from, submerging that something out of yourself. And to be honest, I didn't know about point of view. I didn't know un until gradually I sort of taught myself. It was that sort of what happened was Malcolm and Angela responded to your particular text. So they would look at each line or a big chunk and say, well, that's not quite working. That's, but they didn't really use technical language because it hadn't really grown at that point. It was more in America than it was in Britain. So I come from the, I come from the magic side. And I think a lot of writers n new to writing today come from the more scientific, technical side. And it's actually getting them to relax and allow the naughty stuff to come through because a lot of technical oh let's let's make sure it's in this point of view let's make sure I mean these are all important but it can really kind of tighten your writing and make it a little bit formal and particularly with fiction and more and actually more so with non-fiction now because you've got creative non-fiction it's letting that bit of you in there that bit of magic because everybody's unique and that's the exciting thing about a really, really good book is when you've got that, that strangeness of an individual in there. Okay, so when we start to talk about rewriting, redrafting and editing um, as three sort of slightly different but often overlapping um, processes, why is it important to revise one's work? Or is it? Oh, oh, terribly, terribly, terribly important. It's like... Um, 99% of writing. A lot of uh, beginner writers um, think the main thing is getting it down on the page and then it's done. It's not done. It, unfortunately, this is the kind of... Uh, is it shocking news? I don't know. To some people it is. You've got to do far more work. You've got it out on the page. Congratulations. But that's nowhere near sort of finished. So revising, redrafting, editing, essential, essential part of the process. Um, yeah, I can't say anything more than that. And, and again, when we spoke, you said that, and I found this fascinating, um, is that it's just as important to find out what kind of writer you are and that that will then help guide what kind of yeah. writing or, or rewriting you might need to do. Yes, there's a brilliant essay by Zadie Smith called That Crafty Feeling, and it's about her process, and it's like uh, Zadie's writing. It's very kind of 
relaxed but erudite at the same time. And she talks about her process of writing a novel. And she begins by describing that there's two types of writer. And um, I've discovered this through teaching, but also um, through writing with my partner, because he's a very, very different writer to me. He approaches writing really, really differently. And Zadie Smith says there's two actual uh, types of writer, and if I can remember, there's the macro planner and there's the micro manager. And it's helpful to know which one you are because that will influence how you edit your work and how much editing actually you need to do and what type of editing. So uh, a macro planner is somebody very much like myself who has a kind of vision for their book. Sometimes as a genre writer, actually, I think it kind of is can be geared towards plot, so you can kind of shape the plot out of your book before you start it. Um, you envisage it in big chunks. I kind of like writing in, in parts, so part one, part two, part three, and I see them and imagine them before I actually start writing. That's me, and my partner is the other type of writer, and Zadie Smith says she's this type of writer as well, and that's the micromanager who I, because I'm just going by my partner here, very, very tight and constrained type of writing. I'm sitting in my office going on the keys and then I hear Andrew in his office and there'd be a plink, a plink with a gap in between because the micromanager rewriting is part of their process constantly constantly edging 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 towards what they think they want to write about so Zadie Smith refers to this as more kind of literary fiction writing it's more about trying to find an essence or a mood and progress your book that way. Often she doesn't know how her books are going to end. Um, she doesn't even know what the second chapter is going to be or the third chapter. She's just edging along, trying to, often I think it's coming up through character as well, trying to nail a character. So she talks about writing and rewriting and rewriting the first 20 pages. Once she's nailed the first 20 pages, and I forget which book, I think perhaps it's on beauty, it took her two years to get the first 20 pages how she wanted them to, and then she knew where the book was going to go, and then it was a breeze. So two very different types of writing, so that leads to two very different types of editing, I think. I've, uh, I've heard that, and tell me if this, if this maps on, but I've heard this uh, Stephen King's famous phrase of, of a pantser, are you flying by the seat of your pants? And you just start, you don't know where you're going, yes. and you just, or, yeah. and the, uh, the other ones being outliners or, or plotters, yeah. where you have this complete sort of Excel spreadsheet of a plot, and all your, all your writing is doing is joining these sort of pre-existing you know, uh, dots yeah. together. Yeah. Um, so it seems to map onto that. It does, and of course with, with anything, it's not concrete, so there's gonna be mm. some kind of um, merging with with the two but I think I think actually you know if you are a, 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 a micro manager I think you know if you're that type of person I think with the macro planner there's there's more gaps in there I think and you can slip into micro management at certain points mm. So when we talk about you know, rewriting, redrafting and editing, I guess sort of colloquially you know, you know, people might know what that means or use that, that language and possibly interchangeably. But yeah. can you break down you know, sort of, as technically as po possible what we sort of mean by those three different terms? Okay, I, or are they interchangeable? I think they are interchangeable. Okay. And I think um, uh, I'll tell you what I think they are. I mean, I... Actually, I would call them all editing, but if you want to break it down, it's kind of quite handy to do uh, uh, think of it as um, rewriting, redrafting, editing. Um, so this is my interpretation. Um, so rewriting is what writers do all the time, even begin, beginner writers. Um, so say you're given 
an exercise to write a thousand words on a character. You'll start that and then they'll go to somebody, or your tutor will say tea break. So you're going off for your tea break, then you come back. You have to read through what you've written before in order to be able to continue it. And when you read through it, you will start tweaking it. And that's part of the writing process. Every I write every single day. I'm lucky enough to do that. And um, so I always, in order to know where I'm going, is I read through what I wrote the day before in order to get the kind of tone, to understand, oh, yes, I've actually moved that character into that room now. We're in that room. We're no longer in that room. Um, and as I read, I think, oh, appalling sentence. That word shouldn't be there. I'll take that out. So that's that's rewriting. And you'll do that kind of nat naturally. I think m most writers do that. And it's interesting, again, as, um, I mean, I was a journalist for the first 10 years of my life, and the words sub-editing, editing, um, okay. are, are, are different. Yeah. You know, you would use those um, differently. But again... Into when chatting, they might feel like they're sort of similar, and where I wouldn't be able to tell you where the edges of one, yes, uh, you know, yeah. the, when they when they bleed into into each other. So, take us a bit more through like the levels of the kinds of things we might be talking about when we're rewriting. And, and in my mind, again, from sort of um, from a journalistic point mm -hmm. of view, is if you're editing, you're moving whole chunks around, you're deleting whole mm -hmm. chunks. It's a structural yeah. um, thing, you know. Let's open with this, and you move that to the front. Mm -hmm. Whereas a copy editing or sort of sub editing is more of a line by line crunching language down, that sort of thing, or putting extra um, sentences in, and there may be you know, other sort of increments in between. Yeah, I think that's way down. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I see rewriting as a, a very delicate kind of tweak, tweaking, um, and it's to just sink you back into that world of what okay. you're writing about. So j just sort of playing, playing around with it and it's giving you permission to kind of uh, write on. And you won't necessarily, the little amendments you do won't necessarily be the ones that stay there forever and ever. You will keep going over them and over them and over them. And so, so how does one know then, you know, when you're... Mm -hmm. so if you so you've done your draft, whether you're a plotter or um, you okay. you know you've done your first twenty pages and you've finished or finished that draft, how do you sort of know? Like okay, I, that's the next stage. Okay. So you've done your rewriting, which is the little tweaks that you do to get sink yourself back into your text, so you can write on from it, so you can add the next five or six or seven sentences, um, and then we go into redrafting. And then I think it's kind of quite important what kind of writer you are. Because, say, redrafting, I see that as you've got an entire draft now of your book or your story. So you need to read through it. And, and that read through should ping up thoughts about, oh, that's not working, that's not working. I'll talk a bit later on about the things that you need to address. But for a, a micromanager, they'll probably only do small redrafts because they will have sunk themselves so much into, into this text with that ongoing rewriting of the first few pages that there won't be that much that needs changing. It might be that the ending needs to be moved to the beginning and they may really fight that but that might be something they might have to do. They might actually have to lose that for those first 20 pages because those first 20 pages may have all been preamble. Probably what they're saying in that 20 pages is actually in the rest of the book, so they can get rid, and it's probably very tired having been written over and over. The macro planner, <laughs> the macro planner of which I'm one, will read through their first draft and go... Ah, <laughs> and they will split it up, twist bits around, take out one character, think about changing point of view, think about changing tense. They may say it's in the present tense, they may start writing it in the past tense, then reread it. If that doesn't work, they may fling it back into the present tense again. Um, I think the, the macro planner, though it sounds like they're all sorted, 
are actually the ones that do the most writing in the end. Uh, Can I just read you this? Because this is a quote from Sarah Moss, who wrote uh, Ghost Wall, and it describes her writing technique. And it's it's bonkers, and I'm not sure if it if she's a macro planner or a micro manager. But I just want to throw this in the air because really, it's just to say you will get your own uh, revising, editing, te- redrafting technique as you go along. You will find the best thing that works for you. And Sarah Moss, um, and she wrote the great slim novel called Ghost Wall. She says, for every novel I write a full draft and then I delete it and write it again properly. I even delete it from the trash can. So she erases it completely from the computer. It's like being a dressmaker, mocking it up in a cheap fabric to then make it in silk later. Now, I think she's incredibly brave. I could. She's very trusting that it'll surface that book that she's written that draft will surface and that the best bits of it will surface yeah Yeah. i mean it's hard enough looking at something and deleting a sentence and thinking i kind of like that you know i yeah yeah, i almost like want to keep it in a document of nice paragraphs or language or metaphors or whatever just to sort of pluck out i could could you do that could you write a book and delete it i've got all my drafts from all my books they're all on my computer, pre-computer, they're in stacks of piles. I can't let them go. I can't let them go because it's uh, it's almost like if I let just one draft go, the whole book will f- f- fall to pieces. Um, so, yeah. But I just thought I'd like to throw that in there because that's the maddest ed- editing, redrafting technique I've ever come across. And well done to her. And I understand now why her books are slim. <laughs> I really do. I have to say, I couldn't, couldn't promise you that if I, if you know, people have said like if they you know, delete a, they lost a book, um, you know, lost a draft or yeah. something. I just couldn't bring myself to do it again. I'd have yeah. to do a different book. Yeah. I just exactly, exactly, because you get exhausted and and also you'll be frightened that you won't do it as well, or you'll be constantly sitting at your desk thinking, oh, there was something that went after that yeah. scene in the river and it was really good. I just can't remember what it is. So, yeah. I feel like I'm bringing so many like ideas that each idea is kind of nudging its way to be the next thing that you write about. And so to say, well, no, I've got this one idea and that's going to occupy me for however yeah. much longer. Yeah. Yes. Um, but um, so is that... Is that the sort of, are there next steps and types of re, re, reworking beyond that? Well, I think if we put Sarah Moss to one side, because I think she's an exception, but in the redrafting stage, things to be aware of, I think. I, I like to refer to actually my partner's book, The Art of Writing Fiction. His name's Andrew Cowan. He's got a different surname to me. That was a political move. (laughs) Um, Anyway, so these are the things that you have to look out for. All writers need to be readers. So you will read through your first draft and you will have a sense of what's not working. But you may not have a sense of why it's not working. This is why writing courses are useful. This is why how-to books are useful. And Andrew's book, The Art of Writing Fiction, is a kind of how-to book. And he's got a chapter on revision, grammar and punctuation. He's, He's crazy about punctuation. But let's put that to one side at the moment. But the things... The main things that you need to think about are showing and telling. So whether you're actually dramatising or summarising. And there needs to be a good balance between the two. Now, this is only kind of a quick podcast, so I can't really go into it. But you will find in how-to books, they'll talk about showing and telling. This is definitely come across from the American tradition. And there is a little bit of a backlash now where people are saying, we can do more telling than showing. Um, So places and people is another thing. For example, do your settings influence or reflect the mood of your characters? Do they resonate with the themes of your story? So that's another thing. There's five chunky things. Next thing, voices. Does your dialogue sound natural? 
Do your characters speak at cross purposes, hide more than they show? Does your dialogue advance the plot? So, again, Andrew has absolutely loads of questions about voice. Viewpoint, which is kind of slightly linked to voice. Is, is your narrator a reliable guide to the world of fiction? Also, should your book be written in first, second or third person, which is I, you, he, she. I'm terrible because I like all the persons. So, <laughs> so in my memoir, I used first person, but then I had my dad speaking and I used second person. But I think you have to be extremely controlled about that and I'd suggest that you only do it after you've done masses, years of writing um, to be able to control it quite well. You can't dip from one person to the next from writing in an I point of view and then go into a he point of view in the next sentence. That's terrible. Your reader will get a headache. And then finally the structure. Massive thing. Is there a de definite beginning, middle and end? Some people would say you don't need a definite end. You can kind of have a hanging sort of end. Do you have an inciting e event? So your plot comes in here. So it, is there a point where the story begins to change? It begins to, to swivel. Are your events in the best order? Um, should you t move them around a bit? So there's such a lot to think about. And I think that happens in the redrafting stage. So can I ask, I can certainly see how someone who uh, sits down with an idea and starts writing, mm. that that would seem very important to be able yeah. to sort of take, yes. you know, the, the sort of fabric that you've just woven and then chop it into pieces and move it around. Yeah. But for the, for the planners, would you, would you hope that actually that that's sort of a, a given it would be, and also maybe harder to move things around because if the plot is a sort of a foregone conclusion, yeah. to say, oh, well, actually, well, maybe it just means that it's larger. I need a new person. I've got two thirds of the way in, or I've got, done my draft. I realise that I need a MacGuffin kind of, you know, somewhere yeah. in the beginning yeah. to, to drive something. So you've got to rewrite the whole thing with this new thing. I must admit that the micro planner world is totally alien to me, and I can only go through. Uh, my experience of living with Andrew, with living with a micro micromanager, living with a micromanager, I've learnt that the, the book rarely changes once it's been established. So Andrew said to me, his last book that he wrote, he was, um, he said to me one morning, I'm going to write a novel that is going to proceed in 10 chapters. Each chapter is going to be for a year of a young boy's life. So it's going to go from his first memory to, and he, he places the first memory in the first year to, the, to year 10, when he's 10 years old. And that structure remained. That's what he worked, worked within. And what changed were slightly the scenes within those chapters. So he had the whole thing there. But it took him a long time to get the voice of this boy. And the voice of this boy changes because the boy grows. He made the technical decision not to write it in the I voice. He wrote it in the second person, the you voice. So he's addressing this boy as he's growing up. So he doesn't have the struggles with the a boy's voice as it grows, as it gets older and mature and sees life differently. So he made very big technical decisions right from the start. 10 chapters, 10 years in a boy's life, will be a boy, but it will be written in second person from the point of view of the man that the boy became. That didn't change. It didn't change. It was just the little scenes within it. It's a totally different way of writing. But there are writers out there, and I have met them in my, you know, when I, I teach them, and I'm astounded by them every single time that I come across them. They're a totally alien species to me. And so are there any other um, 
of the you know we've talked about the kinds of things that one might address in mm. in rewriting and uh, and re- redrafting. Are there any other sort of bits and pieces you know next level down, next level along? Yeah, the next level along, and you actually might include this in your redrafting level is show your work to other people. Don't just show it to yourself. It's really hard to show your work to other people. It's super scary. One of the good things about the online courses, the Right Centre online courses is people have to post up responses. Well, they don't have to, but they're encouraged to um, post up their responses to exercises. So Mm -hmm. right from the start, they're posting little bits of their writing for other people on the course, other students, and me, the tutor, sometimes I respond often. So they're showing their writing immediately. But it is difficult. It is, you do feel vulnerable. I feel vulnerable. I hold my writing to myself for a long, long time. And then I go, oh, Andrew, I've got a book here I'd like you to look at. Show it to a trusted friend. Show it to someone who does loads of reading, who may be a writer themselves. And get them to say, to read it and to respond. Just tell you the bits that aren't working for them. That may be enough. Or you can quiz them if they say... I really didn't like this character and I had to stop reading because of this character. Then say to them, why, why, what is it about, what was it about that character? So get somebody else to read it. Then you may have to go right back to the redrafting stage or you may just need to do tiny little tweaks. You might have written a wonderful kind of book straight away. That would be amazing. (laughs) And do remember that there's different kinds of reader. So you you will find eventually a reader that you trust. But it might be when you're starting out, it is best to give your script to, say, two or three people who can bear to read it. And then you will get, then you'll be able to work out who's your ideal reader. And it's not necessarily the one that says, this is fantastic. It's likely to be the one that says, it could be fantastic. So find your trusted reader, rework your book according to their comments, but always have faith in yourself too. Cling on to those bits that you that you love and think are working. Then you'll end up with another draft. If you're still unsure about it, then it's worth sending it off to a professional reader, like the literary consultancy. They um, employ experienced writers to read people's scripts. I used to do a lot of work for them, and you get a lot of attention. So the literary consultancy, Gold Dust, which is run by Jill Dawson, that's kind of quite local, that's a, a Cambridge-based... I'd say as well, actually, just um, uh, only from poking around online, I found uh, a group on Facebook of beta readers, um, and two, wow, two people in the US sort of were happy to read through, uh, read through and, and give feedback. So um, mm. it's... Um, I mean, I was amazed to find that there were a bunch of people yes. out there who were happy to receive <laughs> I know 70, some words. people, yeah. <laughs> and you get one. Yeah, so it was, well, it was great, yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of quite old school, so I don't know what's out there, sort of uh, uh, out there in the internet world or what have you, but that's fantastic if you can find uh, readers and you trust them and you don't mind winging your script off to somebody that you you don't really know um i think that's you know that's one way to go into it it certainly gives you if you if you sent it again to four people Mm. if if a piece of feedback comes back more than once pay attention to it yes exactly if somebody points out something that somebody else has also pointed out then i think you have to you have to pay attention yeah yeah Sorry, then I was going to say the next stage is when you think you've got the perfect script, you really do need to go through it for those niggly kind of grammar, punctuation. Ah! I love that though. That's the bit. I, I love the fine tuning. <laughs> oh no! Oh, God. Oh. It's the journalist in me now. Oh, yes. It's the sort of fine tuning. <laughs> yeah. I struggle with that. I was going to recommend another book like the creative writing course book and there's a brilliant final revisions and submission so that's prior to submitting to an agent or a, a pub, well it'll genuine usually through it through an agent but say if you're submitting to a short story competition or a first novel competition 
then it's useful for that. And uh, it's written by Penny Rendell, and she talks about text layout. She talks about grammar, punctuation. Uh, there's a whole thing about punctuating dialogue. Uh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I used to religiously do, uh, the, you know, the two quote marks. Now I enjoy the freedom of not having quote marks, but it's kind of a lot more difficult to make sense that mm, that yeah, way um, s- but as long as you're aware of what you're doing and don't have quote marks in one bit of the book and non quotes for your dialogue in another bit of the book yeah. well, don't be inconsistent yeah, know the yeah. rules before you break them <laughs> yes exactly yeah yeah and then so and then when that's all we polished up you can send it off to your competition you can send it off to see if you can get an agent And then if you're lucky to be accepted by an agent, your agent may say, some agents have editors in-house now, and their in-house editor will be super ruthless, and then it'll be sent out to publishers. And publishers, less so, they used to have real strong editing departments, but that's changed quite a bit now. But you do still, you will have some editing comments. I think perhaps you get more attention from small publishers with the, the editing than the larger publishers, but that might be a bit controversial. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned something when we when we spoke that I'm really um, I'm so interested to ask you this is you said that each piece of writing has its own set of rules when it mm-hmm. comes to rewriting and redrafting. You know, what are those rules, and how does one know and sort of differentiate? Well, this is this sort of project. I, I'm Jack Kerouac. I'm not going to revise anything. It's just you know. Uh, or, that's such a hard question. It, um, I think it's something you only become aware of the more you write and you begin to realise what kind of writer you are and uh, what kind of genre genre you're settled in, if you are settled in a genre. Um, the genre itself will have rules that you'll, that you'll need to obey. Um, more literary fiction writers, those that kind of play with form and style, they begin to set their own rules. Um, and also the story itself sets it, its own rules. And I think this is where individual feedback, very experienced individual feedback comes in because that that editor will recognise the rules that are within this book. And I mean, one of the simple rules that I've just talked about is you've set yourself the rule of not um, punctuating your dialogue. And therefore, that will mean you will set yourself another rule. Does that mean in order to make your dialogue clearer to your readers, you drop the dialogue down a line, you separate it on different lines? Or do you do something more technically different? difficult is set it within a paragraph of action and how do you distinguish it from the action only you will know how to do that actually related to that possibly related to that something that i've um uh, seen done a bunch of different ways is thinking i've seen mm-hmm. thoughts do you put it in italics do you yes. have it as just this, you know um, non italicized and he thought yeah. she thought um, so I've seen that done in sort of tackled a variety of different ways even set, some occasionally done in a different font yes yeah. um, or you know and I think technology plays a role in this as well I read a lot of science fiction and sometimes you've got sort of some sort of cerebral link and so the font is different to the sort of the Times Roman that we might be used to so you use a sans serif font or something so so you can be much more playful absolutely much more playful and again that's bringing in your own rules as well into the text oh I'm going to use italics for this or I'm going to use a handwriting font for this you can really play around with it but what I'd say is beware it doesn't get too messy yeah. and too playful because reading is about the eye and the eye can get very disturbed by lots of kind of font changes and uh, too much busyness. You've got to be able to relax into reading so the eye needs not to be kind of distracted really I always think as well um, I think it's called communicative competence which is as long as you can communicate the thing you want to communicate and so therefore it's about meaning like if you're losing the meaning Mm -hmm. if someone does not associate your italics with thought or speech or 
and the, I know it's slightly um, tangent, but the difference between quotes and inverted commas. Yes. And I know it's a US UK style or what it is, mm-hmm. but to know that you know you got to use that consistently. You know, are it inverted commas to, for irony and and so on. So yes, yeah. it's um, yeah. yeah. It sounds like I'm like your other half. I like the kind of detailed punctuation <laughs> you, you kind do, of stuff. You yeah, do, you do. And also, that's just reminding me that when you do get to a publisher, they'll have their house style right, as yeah. well, and. Uh, Oh, that's a sort of night, nightmare, or can be a night, nightmare working with, within that. I have a real problem with American spellings. I don't want American yeah. spellings. I want British spellings, you know, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and so just um, uh, to sort of to, to bring all of this round um, is, as you mentioned at the very beginning, uh, because it's, there are, you, we can't make these absolute rules and it's hard to say every, you know, if you're writing a story, it should be X or even within a genre. Um, and so we, we mentioned again when we were talking earlier about um, some successful edits and rewrites and sort of mm-hmm. to be able to describe a handful of those things so that the people listening can go, well, how do I know when to apply X or Y or am I like that or is that happening to something that I'm writing? Mm. Have you got any sort of like examples of um, you know, rewrites or suggestions for things that came in and there was an issue with them yeah. and there was a rewrite or redraft and, and what aspect of it that they tackled? I mean, this is very difficult to answer because it is about a particular text you always refer uh, there's no sort of uh, apart from the things that I pointed out that Andrew raised that you need to look at but each text whether a short story whether a longer piece a novel or whether a non-fiction book like I've said will have its own rules and everything like that so it, it's very particular to each piece of work but just recently um, a very good short story writer uh, submitted their novel to me. It was part of their Arts Council grant. So uh, they paid me for a bit of mentoring and to read through their their text. And so they were a short story writer and they've written a novel. Uh, it was working very, very, very well, but there were things that needed changing. So the things that needed changing was one character was quite evasive. I couldn't work out where this character came from and how they viewed themselves. And I realised it was the sensitive issue of race. And Deborah, the writer, was really conscious of how sensitive this issue was, that actually she wasn't addressing it all in the book. And so the character was coming out as a a sort of mystery or even a bit of a blank. So I said to you, you've you've got to face this head on. And now there are editors in publishing houses, uh, sensitivity editors, who will address kind of issues of race and gender and will kind of help you with with that but it was something that she needed to deal with first and to think about what elements she were was she was evading and how she could make it kind of clearer or just make the character kind of come into uh, visibility a bit more so there was that and then there was also the thing with the structure of it is that because she was a short story writer every single chapter was straining or even reached an epiphany like short most short stories do um, so they're kind of resolved but in a, a novel it needs to be a little bit more ragged, less neat at the end, well, I feel, at the end of the chapter, in order for you to want to to read on. And it felt a little bit claustrophobic, each chapter being nicely rounded. Yeah, it was just a little bit suffocating, so I suggested that she kind of tried to open that out a bit and relax a bit. I think short story writers are kind of quite tight writers, and uh, you know the really good ones and then novel writers and novels themselves are baggier and uh, a, a little bit more ruffled so what does that mean on the page that's really interesting I found that I did what everyone does which is you go I'm going to write and so you write uh-huh. a novel yeah. and it's you, you don't know what you're doing so I now write sort of I think it's novelette is technically the length that I write. Okay. So like very long, short, like mm-hmm. tiny novels. Um, but I found that, that that format works. But it's interesting. What does that mean on the page when you're saying, I can see how it's tight. It's a complete mm-hmm. sort of episode. 
how how did how did the writer sort of tackle loosening things up? Was it a, was it a case of things that were irresolute, or what was it that? Um, I don't know. She's still rewriting, okay. so she's probably, and I expect this will be happening, will be finding it very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. She's set herself a difficult task anyway in that the book is from maybe three or four points of view. So kind of, I suppose it almost naturally felt like, oh, I'm having, say, Fred here. This can be a little nugget about Fred. And then I'll have uh, Sophie here and that'll be a little bit nugget nugget about her and this moment in her life but the thing is they have to be interwoven they have to speak to each other um interconnected interconnected and they were in a way but not but not enough yet they needed to bleed together a bit more those voices could be separate but their lives need to need to be closer and more kind of connected um, yes, yeah, so she'd set herself an enormously difficult task. She will get through it because she's a really, really hard worker and this is one of the things about writing. It's hard work. She will get through it, um, but it will take her some time because she's got to, and this is a Stephen King, I think it's a Stephen King quote, you've got to lose your babies, or Truman Capote, you have got to lose sometimes those very precious bits. Sometimes you can kind of hang on to them, but sometimes... You have to go bye bye and just kill your darlings. Yeah. And, yeah. Kill your darlings. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Lynn, thank you so much thank for coming you. in to talk today. That's awesome. I can already feel all like exactly the things to, to actually apply to, uh-huh. to writing. So that's brilliant. Thank you so much for coming in. Well, pleasure. Thank you. A huge thank you to Lynn for her time. And don't forget that you can find out more about our creative writing courses, workshops, and mentoring on our website. If you have questions or want to get in touch, you can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Writer Centre, and you'll find us on Facebook by searching National Centre for Writing. Don't forget to sign up to our weekly newsletter by visiting nationalcentreforwriting.org.uk and clicking the orange drop-down box on the homepage. As a UK-registered charity, we rely on the generosity of our supporters to make our work possible. You can make a donation over on the website today by hitting the Support Us button in the top nav. Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review us because it helps other writers to find the podcast. Thanks again, keep writing and we'll catch you on the next episode.